Today we're going to look at the seven goals of macroeconomics. So each economy, whether you're talking about the province of Alberta, the country of Canada, or the country of Zimbabwe, uh, each economy has its own goals or priorities. And so what we find is that there are seven general goals that economies have. And the problem is, is you can't have all seven. That when you try to achieve one, it hurts your ability to achieve another. And so economies have to prioritize. So we're going to look at these seven different goals. And we're going to look at, for each one of them, what is the goal? Where do we currently stand? How do we achieve the goal? And what are some of those complications or difficulties in achieving the goal? So when you achieve one, uh, which other goals are hurt in the process? All right, so let's start with the first one, which is improved standard of living. Let's just scroll up here. So when we talk about improved standard of living, we're talking about the degree to which people have access to the goods and services that make their lives easier, better, healthier, safer, more enjoyable. The idea here is that if you have an improved standard of living, you have more access to healthcare, education, a cleaner environment, more entertainment, more culture, and so on. So we need a way to estimate that standard of living, that access to the goods and services that make your life better. And so one way to approximate the standard of living is to look at gross national income per capita. So let's break this down. So the per capita part just means per person. So if we want to know if individually we are better off, we need to look at the access that each of us have to those goods and services that make our lives better. So we look at it per person or on average, do people have access to more goods and services that make their lives better? If we just do it collectively as a group, then it's harder to understand whether or not uh, then that you're better off. So one way to approximate the improved standard of living is to look at your gross national income per capita. So per person, we're looking at gross national income. So what do we mean by that? Well, let's break that down further. So national income is how we make our money. So that would be our wages, right? Getting paid a salary. That would be interest, the money you earn on capital. We have rent, that's the money you're paid for, land, and profit, that's the reward to our entrepreneurs. So national income is the way we make money, and the way we make money in terms of economic terms is wages, interest, rent, and profits. Now, the other thing we look at is gross national income. So we have to add one more piece to our definition. So when we look at gross national income per capita, we're looking at the wages, the interest, the rent, and the profits of Canadians regardless of where they live. So the challenge, of course, with standard of living is that you might have people within your country who send money out, who bring money in. Uh, you might have foreigners living in your country who make all their money from work they're doing outside your country. So if you want to know if there's an improved standard of living for your people, we need to look at the citizens of our country. So we're looking at the money that's earned, the wages, interest, rent, and profits of Canadians, and they may be living inside the country or outside the country. So for example, uh, I'm an American living in Canada, and so I am included in national income because I earn a wage teaching this course, but I am not part of gross national income because I am not a Canadian, even though I am in Canada. Now, if you are a Canadian and you're living abroad, let's say you got a great job in France, then you would be included in gross national income uh, because even though you're making that money abroad, your standard of living uh, is higher. You have access to more healthcare, education, uh, things in Canada when you return. 
The, the reason that we look at gross national income per capita is there are countries that bring in a lot of their labor from other nations, okay? Or where there are remittances, where people who work in the country are foreigners who send the money back to other countries. So we look at gross national income per capita. All right. Let's see if we can get this to scroll up here. So we're looking at does that gross national income change? And we wanna look at it in real terms. We wanna take out inflation because if you are simply making more money, but all of those goods and services that make your life better cost more, do you really have more access to goods and services or is it just the same goods and services? So we adjust it for income and we'll look at how we do that this semester. Uh, so we're looking at gross national income per capita in terms of real income. Now the challenges with gross national income, per, or sorry, the challenges with trying to improve your standard of living is that it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that everyone is better off. So you could do endeavors uh, in your country to encourage people to make more money. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to work and make more money, right? Sometimes the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Well, the challenge with using gross national income per capita is on average, the amount people are making goes up, but it doesn't mean that everyone is better off. The other challenge with using GNI per capita is it doesn't take into account factors such as the impact on the environment, right? We could all make more money uh, strip mining, using all of the resources in the economy. We could all commute, and so there's lots of pollution. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean that life is better uh, if we take into consideration the impact that we're having on environment and, and pollution. So it is an approximation for greater access to goods and services that make your life better, uh, but it does have some limitations. It also doesn't take into account what's happening with the crime rate, right? So if your life is better, then you are safer, secure, uh, but just because we're making more money uh, doesn't tell us what's happening with crime. So there are some challenges with using GNI per capita as an estimate of standard of living and in measuring standard of living in general. So where do we currently stand when it comes to uh, our standard of living? So what you see here on the left is what is happening to real income over time. So if we take out inflation, we can compare from year to year and we can see that over time, the amount of money we are making is going up. So we're able to buy more goods and services, access to more education, healthcare, things that make our life better. So we put it in real terms so that we can compare one year to the next. Now, if we wanna compare um, one country to the next, then we need uh, to put it in similar funds. So I'm just going to move my face. Oops. Let's try that again. Uh, moving the slides and not my face. Let's try moving my face here. All right. So if we look at GNI per capita, this is an international dollar. So what they do is it's a weighted average of multiple uh, different currencies so that we can compare across countries. It used to be that you compared all of um, things that across countries, you would compare it all in US dollars because that was kind of seen as the standard. Um, but as the U.S. economy isn't necessarily the dominant economy worldwide anymore, you'll see a movement towards international dollars, this bundle of currencies. So if we were to compare here, you can see that GNI per capita in international dollars in the U.S. is 66,000, in Canada 47,500. So that would suggest the standard of living in Canada, our access to goods and services on a per person basis is lower in Canada than in the U.S. And so you can see some of the countries that have the highest GNI per capita, uh, Qatar, Singapore, Bermuda, you can see others that have uh, some of the lowest GNI per capita, Congo and Burundi. Remember that uh, GNI per capita is 
the citizens of that country regardless of where they live. Uh, so as we look at some of the higher GNI per capita, they may import uh, lower labor workers, lower income workers. Um, for, as foreigners, they would not be included in the GNI per capita. So if the, the landowners, the business owners are the people in your country and you bring in labor from another country, then your GNI per capita uh, would be higher than in a country where the, the labor, the worker, and the business owner are both from your own country. Now, uh, what about uh, Alberta? What about um, Canada? So here we have it in international dollars for Canada. If we were to look at it in terms of nominal income, so not taking out inflation, uh, we would be looking at the average Canadian has income about, oops, I don't know what that is. It has income about 58,535. In comparison, in Alberta, the average income is 63,856. So you can see uh, that the uh, income per capita here in, re in, sorry, in nominal terms is higher in Alberta than across Canada. So standard of living, is that higher in Alberta? Uh, well, that's going to also depend on inflation, right, in terms of how much it costs to buy those goods and services, which is why we convert it into real terms. And so if you were to compare in real terms, that's 63,856, if we take out inflation, so we have a benchmark year, we, we'll look at that later this semester, how we do that. We would convert that into 42,486. In comparison, in Canada, it would be 41,135. So even if you adjust for inflation, the cost of those goods and services, you can see the average income in Alberta, oops, is higher than it is in the rest of Canada. And in order for you to see that, let me move my face. I don't want me to put my face on the top. There we go. So we can compare the standard of living across countries, across time, um, by looking at one way to measure it is to look at this gross national income uh, per capita is one way to compare that standard of living across time or space. Now, there are other ways to compare uh, standard of living. So other ways to approximate that standard of living is to look at what we call the human development index, uh, to look at the poverty rate or to look at the level of education. So let's look here at education. Uh, this, what you see here, is the results of the PISA test. That is a program for international student assessment. So it's a common exam taken across countries. Uh, and if you were in Red Deer Public in 2009, you were actually part of the Canada sample. So they, they pick uh, cities across the country to take the test and then it's used to compare education across countries. Uh, you can see here the 2006 and the 2012 results and we can see Canada here in 2006 was seventh in math and then fell to 13th. And in reading you can see Canada was fourth in reading in 2006 and fell to eighth in 2012. So we can look at the uh, education rates across countries. The idea, the more educated the population, uh, the greater amount of goods they're producing, the, um, the more money they're making, the more access to things that make your life better, right? The more educated your population, the more people you have trained in arts, in culture, in medicine, and, and so on. So the question is, when it comes to education, if we put more money into education, does that mean that our students will perform better? So what you see here on the left uh, is a graph from The Economist that looks at a public spending on education and does is there a correlation? So if the government spends more 
on education do they perform better and you can see it doesn't necessarily correlate some of the countries that spend more uh, have lower scores then the question is begged what if we pay the teachers more so if we pay your instructors more will you perform better on uh, the PISA so I'm just gonna shift this over just slightly and you can see here on the right the teacher's salary and then their performance uh, so is there a correlation it doesn't look like that there is a relationship between the scores and how much the teachers are paid all right so we can measure our standard of living with what gni per capita and really real GNI per capita. We can look at the education rate. We can look at the number of people below the poverty line, the percentage below the poverty line, so the poverty rate. And we can look at the human development index. So let's take a look at the human development index. Get this all to fit here. So the human development index uh, takes life expectancy okay combines that with the education rate and gni per capita so we talked about some of the challenges with using gni per capita as a measure of standard of living so by incorporating in the education and life expectancy, then we're trying to find a better way to approximate that access to goods and services that make your life better. And so you can see here on this graph uh, some of the countries and their GNI per capita. So the, the parentheses after the country tells you their ranking. So Norway one, United States four, Canada six, uh, in the world in terms of the Human Development Index. We can look at some of the countries that have seen the most change in their Human Development Index. Often these are countries that are going uh, through upheaval, so it might be war. Um, Venezuela, we've been looking at this semester in terms of uh, hyperinflation and, of course, Libya, Syria, a uh, number of countries that have had um, struggle, civil war, um, conflict within their country is going to impact your access to goods and services that make your life better. So we looked at the first uh, economic goal, which is standard of living, and we can measure that with GNI per capita, gross national income. So that's the income of your citizens, regardless of where they live. So wages, interest, rent, and profits. And when we looked at the human development index, which combines that with other measures to create a better approximation of the access to goods and services. And we can also use the poverty rate or education rate.